It's good to be here, and uh, boy, uh, I know some of you know this, but I, I heard, and I had actually heard on Saturday of last week, that um, CJ hit a Upper Decker home run with his Presbytery sermon, and in God's providence, he allowed him to be ready to do another Upper Decker uh, for Sunday morning. Amen? If you were here, I mean, I heard nothing but glowing reports, um, and I just want to say, I don't even know if CJ's here this morning, but uh, thank you to that, and um, yeah, he, he, was, he was awesome. Um, we're in the book of Hebrews, and um, we are talking about Jesus, and this really, it's, it's, it's what it's all about, Jesus and Jesus some more. And um, as we think about this, just as a point of vision for our church, uh, as we had our session meeting a week and a half ago, um, you know, a, exactly a year ago, and by the way, I don't know if you know this, but this week, the third Sunday in, in September, is our 14th year as a, as a Sunday morning church. Amen? 14 years right here. Like, that's today. That's awesome. I mean, unbelievable. What God has done, He's sustained our church. But um, we, a, a year ago, we had a Sunday night uh, before, you know, of course, before COVID or anything, um, we had a, a vision casting night where we said, you know, here's what we want to do. We want to finish out the sanctuary, and that's to knock out the back two walls here, and we would like to um, expand uh, so where you could walk right into the kids' area or the, the preschool area. But then we also feel like, um, as, as, we, as we listened to what we felt like God was kind of, pr- how, he, how he was prompting us, we thought, okay, we want to build a church and we want to start a preschool but we know another main avenue stream to people's hearts in this community is through sports. And in uh, Tampa, Florida, uh, to have a gymnasium would be huge. It'd be an air-conditioned gymnasium to where we could do a number of sports ministries, uh, both with um, uh, basketball leagues and different things we could do. It could be used by the preschool, a sports camp during the summer. And I just want to continue to put that out there. Uh, we still feel like God wants us to, to move in this direction. We know this pandemic has caused all kinds of, of questions and pauses for that. But um, remember, when, when we had 64 families uh, give $1 million to get us here at 13521 Racetrack Road, it was all based upon this idea that we wanted to be a crossroads, Jeremiah 6, right? So if anybody in West Chase or this area had a question about God. We wanted them to come here. That, that was our prayer. God, if, if you're moving in people's hearts, we want to, we you know, this land was supposed to be uh, 35 acres of acre and a half lots, right? Big lots with big houses. But then the recession hit in 2008, and next thing you know, we got this land on the cheap. And so God gave it to us for 600, I think it was $650,000, 32 acres that we have, and that was so huge. And then we had these 64 families um, you know, sacrifice and give us a million dollars so that we can move here. And I think, okay, God, how are we supposed to be good stewards of this? And we, we need to continue to cast vision for what we want to do. And we know um, in Tampa, Florida, um, sports is a way into the hearts of different families. And if they'll bring their kid here to maybe play a basketball game or whatever we have here, or if they'll bring their kid here to come to preschool, tell me what happens when someone in their family gets sick or they're going through a divorce or you name it. What if we're the first touch? What if they don't know any other church? They're not Christian. They don't believe in Jesus. All they know is that they're in pain. And we know this. That's why we, that's why we built this. So that in those moments, maybe we might be used by God to offer up the gospel. And so I just want to uh, keep that on the, the front burner for us as a church. We have to continue to cast a vision to say, hey, look, we are not just going to get fat and happy here, though it's fun to get fat and happy, amen? Sorry, okay. It is. It's very fun. We got to stay, right, moving towards st- staying out of our comfort zone saying, okay, God, what would you have for us? And I want to encourage you, each, each family here, um, as we think about what God has for us, uh, we need to continue to have uh, vision. We need to continue uh, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because you know what? Um, this world is broken, and I don't think we know that anymore, right, than, than what we experience right now. 
However, um, I don't know if you watch any, I think it's Netflix, because uh, this week they, they came out with this new series, and it was like this perfect segue right into Hebrews 7, the end of Hebrews 7, and that's where we're going to start it. Verse 18 is where we kind of left uh, two weeks ago. But it was all about this four-part series on the Challenger. And I remember where I was um, uh, over at Cambridge Christian. It was Seminole Presbyterian at the time, and it was lunchtime. And Mrs. McBride was my teacher. And she said, we're going to watch this. We're going to watch Krista McAuliffe, right? And she's going to go up and she's going to be the first science teacher. Miss McBride was a science teacher. She was so pumped, right? And so next thing you know, we got this huge television, right? Right, these really fat televisions buckled down, right? We're all excited, like, here we go, right? We're all excited. And it was like, what, the 92nd second of the of the of the takeoff and you know uh horror happens terror happens it's it was it was horrible and we were i remember we were in our science classroom and then we all bolted outside because you could see it you could actually see the explosion from where we were and we all went outside and we saw this you know this explosion this white cloud and we weren't exactly sure what happened but as you watch this four-part series it's 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 pretty interesting because What you had is this tension, and the government had given NASA billions of dollars, and they said, hey, look, we want this many launches to go. And the director said, we've got, I mean, if they're giving us money, we got to get this, Columbia's got to go up this many times, Challenger's got to go up this many times, and we feel this. And it comes down to, what, uh, three days before the launch, and there's this O-ring that they're nervous about when it gets below 53 degrees, we think this thing malfunctions. But they had done a couple of launches before and it hadn't malfunctioned as as bad as they thought it might. And so they said, you know what? It's this morning. And I remember, uh, because when they said it was supposed to go off at 9.30, and I remember, no, 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 no. I remember it was lunchtime. And then they said, but it was delayed two more hours and it went off like 11.45. I'm like, that's right, I remember that. And um, it was a cold morning. It was one of the coldest January mornings that Florida had ever experienced, especially over at the Cape. And it was this tension between what? We want to put people up in space. We're going to be advanced. We want to push the envelope. And, of course, we want to be safe. And it was this like this tension that you felt throughout this four-part series. What is the right thing to do? Right? Where, where is your starting point for ethics Where is your starting point for this is right and this is wrong? And you think about the world today, and I think we are still there. What is the the, um, floor? Where does the concrete begin to know that when I'm standing on this, right, this is what I know is right and this is what I know is wrong? And I think our world is still asking that question today. And the book of Hebrews picks us up and says, okay, you know what? Um... There's this whole thing called the law, all throughout Exodus and Leviticus. And we start here, Hebrews 7, verse 18. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect. In other words, when we read the, the Ten Commandments, here's what I knew. I couldn't, I couldn't not covet. I could not not steal. My heart was sinful. It didn't make anything uh, perfect. It made it weak and useless. It, It showed me how weak and useless I was. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God, which is, of course, is all an allusion to Jesus. He is... Uh, what, what, what they thought was the law and the hope in fulfilling the law, no one could do it. Moses murdered. David committed adultery. You just walk through the Old Testament. No one could follow the Ten Commandments. So there had to be a what? There had to be a better hope. And I think some of us, maybe this morning, you still rely on your ability to fulfill the law. No, no, no. I, I'm, a, I'm a righteous person. You can think to yourself, I'm a good person. And the book of Hebrews says, come on, you, you can't even come close to fulfilling the law. I mean, if Moses, if Aaron, if David, right, if Samuel couldn't, come on, you can't. Paul, we know, was, was the chief of all sinners. No one can fulfill the law. And then, verse 20. 
in the Old Testament, they, draw, they drew near to God through the priest. And so it says in verse 20, and it was not without an oath. Others became priests without an oath. And all that's referring to is, if you were the son of Aaron, you got to be, be the priest, not because of an oath of God, just because you were the son. You were the blood. And if you were in that line, the Levitical line, you might be priest. But that wasn't because God oathed that to you. But he, verse 21, Jesus, became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. No one could be a priest forever in the Old Testament. Why? Because you die. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, everybody knew that before original sin, Adam and Eve could have lived forever. But the curse of the fall was what? You became immortal. You became a mortal. In other words, you had a, you know, an expiration date. And all of a sudden, we know that there, there had never been a priest forever. Aaron died. All the priests had died. And now, here is this talk about a priest that would never die. This allusion to Psalm 110, that there is an eternal father and he has an eternal son. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding? I mean, there really is. And remember, they were being oppressed by Rome and they were having to believe. You know what? The covenant that God started in Genesis 15, 12, 15, and 17, would that really be fulfilled? And of course, this is what? You are a priest forever. How can you be sure? Well, here's what we know. Romans 20, or Numbers 23, 9, uh, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie. Why would that be? Because men lie. Women lie. Those that are not God, we lie. We change. We are not immutable. The circumstances, they begin to constrict in us. And you know what we do? When push comes to shove, we lie. We say things that aren't true because we, we want to be safe or we want to be secure. God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Turn on the news and you just see news stations trying to find a contradiction. Someone says this and they do that. Someone does this and they say that. Right? We're a, we're, we live in a world right, where the media says everybody contradicts themselves. Because why? Because we change our minds. We are not immutable. We are not um, built upon a rock. We build our houses upon sand. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And then you see in 1 Samuel, moreover, the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind. For he is not a man, uh, a man that he should change his mind. And this is in direct uh, contradiction to King Saul. In other words, what they're saying here is, Jesus, you're going to take two worlds, the world of the priest and the world of the king. And we're gonna, what the illusion is, is this, is that Jesus is the perfect priest and he is the perfect king. And so when you read um, Hebrews 7, 20 uh, and 21, the priest will not change his mind. That's in direct reference to, well, the king doesn't change his mind. The, the perfect king doesn't. In other words, Jesus is the perfect priest. And unbelievably, here comes the royal line that now meshes in with a priest. A priest and a king do not get along. And what, what ultimately the writer of Hebrews is saying, yeah, Jesus is actually, believe it or not, the perfect priest, and he's the perfect king. He's unbelievable. He will change your world. In fact... Here's, what he's, here, here's who Jesus is. Because of this oath by God, the Father, Jesus has become the what? The guarantor. What, is, what does that mean? I mean, what does it mean to have a guarantor? Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. In other words, Jesus is, is the surety of, of a better promise between God and man. Here are a couple, listen to this, def, see this definition of a guarantor. A guarantor guarantees to pay a borrower's, a borrower's debt in the event that the borrower defaults on a loan obligation. Have you ever done that? And I'm not just talking about a financial loan, I'm talking about a moral, 
right, obligation that you have? Have you ever not fulfilled a moral obligation that you know you should have fulfilled? Well, what does the guarantee toward do? It guarantees, right, that that moral payment will be paid. It will be made. A guarantor guarantees a loan by pledging what? His assets. So here's what we do. We sign a covenant with God, and Jesus is our guarantor. He is the one that says, you know what? When you can't make the payment, right? When you can't make the payment, here's what. Jesus will take his assets, and he will then make the payment for you. That is what the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell all of these oppressed Christians. Remember that, right? Remember what the emperor does to you. Remember what Rome does to you. Remember what America does to you, because America will let you down, Christian. It will. You go to any other, it will let you down. And the only true, what? Only true guarantor is Jesus. I love this, and this is kind of out there a little bit, but this is Investopedia, right? I'm sorry. I know it's, you know, whatever. The internet a little bit. But I love this definition, right, of a guarantor. A guarantor is typically over the age of 18. Jesus was 30. He was a rabbi, right? And resides in the country where the payment agreement occurs. That's earth, okay? Guarantors generally exhibit exemplary credit history, Jesus never sinned, and sufficient income to cover the loan payments if and when the borrower defaults, right? He owns the earth. <laughs> the earth is his and everything in it, right? At which the guarantor's assets may be seized by the lender. And if the borrower chronically makes payments late, which we do, which I know you do and I know I do, the guarantor may be on the hook for what? Additional interest owed or penalty cost. You think about the interest you've accrued over time. You think about the late moral payments that you know you should have made. I know I should have made and we didn't make them. And there is a late fee. And here's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. This covenant, this promise that is signed by Jesus as the guarantor means that, you know what? You're off the hook. Does that not sound ridiculous? Amen? Do we not need this? Does the world not need to know that Jesus, right, backs up the loan that we all take? And so the writer of Hebrews is using this promise, this covenant, as a way to describe, you know how much he loves you? Do you know how much um, Jesus is for you and is what is ultimately your advocate? Because the world thinks Jesus in a different, uh, of Jesus in a different way. I, I love this. After stating that Jesus Christ was what? Quote, one of the greatest men that ever walked the earth, rocker, Sammy Hagar, was then asked, what do you think about the claims of Christ to be the way, the truth, and the life? And no one comes to the Father but by me. Here's what Sammy Hagar said. I think that's something man made up. I'm not sure, though. I can't say in my heart that I believe that, but I also can't say that I know for a fact that it's wrong. I think it's just been misinterpreted and taken out of context. I really interpret that as Christ saying, the way I preach life is you don't hurt another, you don't kill, you know, the Ten Commandments. Let's use those for example. I believe that he's saying, this is the way to God. You don't have to go through him and use him like he's saying, I'm the egotist or I'm the vehicle. He's teaching, if you don't obey these rules, you will not go to heaven and not be in touch with God. How do you, how do you interpret Jesus that way? You interpret Jesus that way if you don't read all of Scripture. If you just hear uh, kind of legend about who Jesus is and you think, yeah, I just need to follow the Ten Commandments. And he's saying, the, the writer of Hebrews, as we learned two weeks ago, you cannot follow the Ten Commandments. The law shows you that you're unable to do that. And he goes, he, he continues on, he says this, I think too much emphasis on the man himself. And if he were walking around here today, he would go, hey man, don't be looking at me. I can't save your expletive. Only you can save your expletive. And he made it pretty easy on us. Those rules are simple, the Ten Commandments. Anybody in their right mind could live by those rules. I think that's all Christ was, trying, was really trying to do. You tell me, most people believe that. Most people think that that is what Christ is selling, and it's not. 
He's trying to tell you and me, I am the perfect priest and I am the perfect king. In verse 23, he says this, Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office because they're immortal. These men died. But, because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. This is what the Jewish people couldn't believe. Are you telling me that no longer through the line of Levi uh, will our priests come? Because Jesus is what? In the line of Judah. And Jesus is the permanent priest. Therefore, he is what? He is able, because he lives permanently, to save completely those who come to God through him. Because he always lives to intercede for them. The hope of the Old Testament was this perpetual sacrifice, right? You had to continue to what? To offer animals up. It was was moving on. You you constantly had to, when you send another one, when you send another offering, and what uh, the writer of Hebrews is saying is, look, look, he is a permanent priest. And I think the way that we have to understand this is, you are attached to your priest, And I don't think we can understand temple and tabernacle very well in the United States of America in 2020. I think you have to put it this way. He is your defense attorney. That's who he is. And so if your defense attorney is very eloquent, you're eloquent, right? If he is likable, then you're likable. That's the only way I think we can really understand it in our terms. Jesus is your defense attorney. You reside in him. What he says, you say. He is what? ultimately your advocate and that's what the writer of hebrews is trying to say and not only is he your advocate is he is your permanent advocate he will never go away and his record is your record what you see jesus do his perfect record and he washes his disciples feet and he hangs out with the prostitute and he and he looks at the self-righteous and says i don't want to be like you that's not what i've come for that's your record And it's hard for us to believe. Why? Because in America, we like to earn, right, our income. We want to pull ourselves up from our own bootstraps. And it's counterintuitive to think, no, no, I am going to have to rely on what? My defense attorney and his record. But that's the story of the gospel. That's the story of what a priest actually was for Israel. He was Israel's defense attorney, right? He is Matthew McConaughey in a a time to kill, (laughs) right? That's who he is. My wife thinks he's very good looking, and I get jealous of her, of him. Excuse me, not her. And he goes on to describe, here's the perfect high priest. Such a high priest truly meets our need. Look at these five ways. One who is what? Holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Now let me ask you this. If you take those five, right, those five descriptors right there, and we put them up on the screen here, think about this. Have you struggled with being profane or profanity? Have you struggled over the past month feeling condemned? Like you live in that. Jesus is blameless. Have you felt in your life, maybe it is through the internet or maybe it is through you know, your people or just your own heart, that you feel polluted inside and you walk in here on a Sunday morning and you just feel polluted all in. He is pure. He says, you know what I want Christians to be? Israel, I want you to be set apart. But Christian, West Town Church, I want you to be set apart. If you were to go out into the world, could you be distinguished is there anything that would mark you different? If, if, if someone from Tampa, Florida was an atheist and you are a Christian and an alien came down and followed the two of you around, would there be anything different? Would they see anything different between a Christian and an atheist? And of course we're called to be set apart. But maybe you're struggling with just being in the world. Maybe, student, you're going into your schools and you just want to be accepted by the cool crowd and you will do whatever. You will smoke whatever, you will look at whatever, you will do whatever with your girlfriend or whatever because you know what? I just want to be accepted. And the scriptures say we are called to be what? In the world but not of the world. We are called to be set apart and Jesus was set apart. And unbelievably, you get that record. 
You are distinguished because of him. And finally, do you feel insignificant? Do you feel like your life last Monday through this Sunday morning was absolutely insignificant? Nothing you did made a difference. And you don't make a mark at all in your world. And if anybody followed you around for a week, they would say, whatever. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says. No, because of Jesus, right? His work, Jesus' work is exalted. Therefore, you're not insignificant. You are exalted because your defense attorney is you. You are hidden in the representation of Jesus Christ. Can you not understand that, Israel? Can you not understand that, West Town? We struggle with this. We want to make a payment or, you know, pay penance. That's why some of us, you know, we do feel like, you know, I want to pay penance. I want to have to do these 10 things, right, to make it right. Some of us come from traditions where they would say, do that, right? You need to do these things so you will be right. It's not bad to confess your sin. It's not bad to say our father's. It's not. But if you think you have to do those to be right, then it is bad because you don't understand the gospel. If you feel like you have to do penance to be right with Jesus, to be right with God the Father, because Jesus, the Son, is right with God the Father, you are right with God the Father because he is what? He is your defense attorney. Verse, 70, uh, verse 27. Unlike the other high priest. He does not need to offer sacrifices day after day. First for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Do you know what the book of Leviticus told us? The book of Leviticus said, here's what you need to do. And there's basically five categories. I'm only going to give you three categories of offerings. This is the first one. Is a burnt offering. And so you would say, I'm going to bring this to the priest to your defense attorney, and you give this to God, and you would bring a bull, a ram, a goat, a dove, a pigeon, um, and you would ultimately say, you know what, this is going to signify my love for you. This is all through the book of Leviticus, right? This, is, this would signify your complete devotion to God. You haven't done anything wrong necessarily. You just want to bring these animals to God. But then, there's another, there another category in Leviticus. Let's go to the next one. Is a sin offering. Let's say you had a bad day. Right? Let's say you messed up, right? Well, made, it's mandatory. If you sinned, this was mandatory in the Old Testament. That you, uh, It was made by one who had sinned unintentionally. So let's say you had offended somebody. You had said something that you didn't mean to offend anybody, but you did. And you hurt somebody's feelings really bad, and you found out about it. Or maybe you ate bacon-wrapped shellfish, right? That is unclean food, right? Oh boy, you know, it was uh, Christmas Eve and, you know, they were all wrapped and I just bacon wrapped shellfish. I wanted it, right? Um, that's supposed to be funny. It wasn't funny as I thought it would be. But look, you need to get purified. So what do you need to do? You need to bring an offering to get right, right? You need to bring a male or female animal without blemish, a bull. If you're the high priest, you brought a bull. Uh, or if for the congregation you brought a bull, so for West Town, you bring a huge, right, a bull, a male goat for a king, a female goat or a lamb for a common person. If you were less than a common person, in other words, you made less than whatever the, the amount was, then you only had to bring a dove or a pigeon. Or if you were the poor of the poor, then you what? You brought a tenth of an ephah, uh, a flower for the very poor. What, what were you doing? You were bringing a sin offering. What, what does all this mean? It means Jesus, right, was the offering. He was the perfect offering. What was the other type of offering? If you felt guilt made by a person who had either deprived another of his rights or had desecrated something holy. It made, and, and if you were a leper or you had like boils all over you and you were unclean, your body was unclean in Leviticus, it says you had to bring a guilt offering. This is what you had to do. This is the way you lived. If you wanted to be right with God, you brought a sin offering, you brought a burnt offering, you brought a, a, a guilt offering here. Bring your lamb or bring, uh, bring your ram or bring your lamb, that rhymes, without blemish. And what Jesus is saying is, hey, it's done, right? That whole system, all the prophecies, all the sacrifices, all the priests, it's over. I am the climax of the covenant. I am the end game. 
This is where it all headed. It, I am the point of this whole thing. And just like the Old Testament had to look forward and believe that Jesus was coming, you know what we have to do and have faith? We have to have faith and look back. We have to believe that Christmas morning actually happened. We had to believe that 33 years after Christmas morning, he actually died. And three days later, he rose again from the dead. That's what faith looks like for us. In the Old Testament, if you were Abraham, if you were Moses, if you were David, you had to believe that the king, the perfect priest, the perfect prophet would come, and his name would be Jesus, and he would fill all three of those roles. And that's the point of Hebrews. That's the point of this chapter. Because you know you needed somebody to be the perfect law keeper. You, you, you knew that you needed the perfect king because all the kings messed up. You knew that you had a, a depressed prophet in, in Jeremiah. You had, a, you had a scared prophet in Isaiah. And they were good prophets, but they were not perfect prophets. You needed the perfect one to come. And Jesus was that. And so we end, verse, uh, we end chapter 7 with this. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness. But the oath which came after the law appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever. And this is what is, is the unbelievably glorious truth of the gospel, is that if you are fearing your own guilt this morning, if you are fearing your own failure this morning, you have a perfect priest that is still, what? He is still interceding for you. Where is Jesus right now? What, what does the Bible say? The, it's, it's at the right hand of God the Father. And what he does is he takes your prayers and he intercedes. And he says, hey, you know what? This is what they're praying for. I am your son. I want you to see me when you think of them. You just see me. And God the Father looks down upon his son and he smiles and he looks at you. And it's forever. And so if you're struggling with guilt or if you're struggling with failure or whatever it may be, no. No. This is the answer. This is the answer to depression, if you will. This is the answer to anxiety. This is the answer to what your neighbor is looking for and why they have to get lit and why they have to go to this or they have to go to this woman or to this man and jump around. This is the answer, right? I still haven't found what I'm looking for. The, the, the chorus that goes all throughout uh, our community this is what they're looking for because they were made for this. Would you think about telling, right? Would you think about telling your neighbor this? Would you think about telling your spouse this? Would you think about telling your son or your daughter? So tonight we're going to have a prayer walk, right? From three to six. Here's our, our prayer. Friday nights and Sundays, sixth or eighth grade boys and girls would come on Friday nights and that when they're searching for something real and their parents are going through a divorce, or they're looking at their older brother or sister dealing with some type of intense immorality, they would say, I think there probably is a different way, and we would have something to tell them. And so on Sunday nights, the ninth through 12th graders, we would pray that they would come here and that we would have the gospel to tell them. And that when we start women's Bible study, and we just did our first week, 75 women come, that we could say, you know what, we need to be reminded, this is the answer. This is what we've been looking for, that he has come. Where are you? Why are we going through the book of Hebrews and why in the world are you here? On September the 20th, 2020. And we're talking about a priest. We're talking about an antiquated text that we believe is inerrant and is completely infallible. Because we believe it's the actual word of God that will change our lives. And ultimately it points to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me pray and ask that God works in our hearts in our minds um, for his good and for his glory.